In this video, we are going to learn about how Kubernetes deployment actually works. You can use the same knowledge to understand how pod creation works or how replica set works on Kubernetes. We all know Kubernetes deploys pod when we run deployment. But in this video, we will see how it works under the hood. This video will also help you understand some core Kubernetes components as well. So let's get started. We will follow the deployment sequence to understand how it actually works. And if some bits need more explanation, please let me know in the comment below and I'll try to address them in future videos. Before we begin, remember that Kubernetes is mostly an API based system. It is all about bunch of APIs calling each other to do things. We want this video to be short and understandable. Hence, in order to scope it, we will only discuss about how deployment works and we will not be discussing about authentication authorization part when the request is issued via kubectl. To understand how Kubernetes deployment works, we will take an example of what happens when you type a demo command. Suppose I have a cluster and I want to deploy a deployment named my dash dev and I want to run three replicas of nginx container on test namespace. So to create the deployment, the kubectl command would look something like this. Whenever the request to create a deployment is sent to the API server by a command line using kubectl, uh, it uses imperative command where object schema is generated based on the request sent. Since we ran kubectl create deployment, kubectl prepares to do an API call at endpoint to create a deployment, which looks something like this. Uh, it adds other flags as well, like field manager equals kubectl dash create. If you want to run a command to create a pod, then the endpoint would be different again. Since we are trying to create a deployment by an imperative command, it also generates deployment schema, which looks something like this. It passes that schema as a data option while sending ports requests to the API endpoint. If we wanted to replicate kubectl command via curl, it would look something like this. Of course, the above command would not work as we have not passed the authorization token. Once we ran the kubectl deployment command, it sends post requests to the API endpoint uh, with appropriate headers and flags. You can see this from the logs as well. Once the request is sent to API server, admission controller running on master node intercepts the request before creating any objects. When the request is intercepted by admission controller, it does two things. It validates, mutates the request or sometimes does both. First, the mutating admission controller checks if the request needs mutation, uh, such as incrementing resource quota or adding security contents. Then validating admission controller is run to see if the object passed via the request is valid. If any of the controller in either phase rejects the request, the entire request is rejected immediately and an error is sent to the end user. Once the request is checked by admission controller, Cube API server then updates etcd database with the deployment object. When etcd is updated, end user is prompted on the screen with the message of deployment being created, which would look something like this. One thing to note is that it is still 100, not 100% sure that your deployment would be created and pod will start running. There are various components which needs to be involved for a deployment to be in running state. Another thing to remember is that Cube API server and etcd database are involved in almost all of the operation throughout the process of creating a deployment. Now comes the role of controller manager. There are various types of controllers running on Kubernetes cluster. Uh, they are deployment controller, node controller, namespace controller, replication controller, and more. At its core, Kubernetes has Cube controller manager, which is a daemon that runs continuous loop, which continuously checks the states of the system. It checks the current state of the system throughout the API server and makes necessary changes to attempt to converge to desired state by invoking appropriate controllers to do its job. For this case, we are trying to create a deployment with three replicas set. Hence, the current state of deployment is zero and desired state is one with three replicas. When a deployment object is created in etcd database, deployment controller notices that change and it then creates a replica set object with three replicas of pod and notifies API server. Once replica set is created, API server again updates etcd about the replica set being created. Now when a replica set is added, replication controller notices that change and tries to achieve the desired state which is three replicas of Nginx pod running. Here, replica set then creates three pod objects with the given container image to deploy on the worker node. API server again updates etcd with this change and progresses further. Once this pod object has been created, now the job of replication controller is complete. 
and another request is made to scheduler to find out appropriate node to deploy the pod. Let's talk a bit more about scheduler and how it works. Scheduler keeps watch of any new pod object that is created which do not have node assigned to it. Scheduler assigns pod to the node with the highest ranking. We'll not discuss about 10 toleration, node affinity, node anti-affinity etc here as it is out of scope. For every pod that scheduler discovers, scheduler becomes responsible for finding the best node for that pod to run. Our scheduler reaches displacement decision by taking different scheduling principle into account. Scheduler uses two or step operation to figure out which node is feasible to run the pod, which is filtering and scoring. Filtering checks whether a candidate node has enough resource available to meet pod specific resource request. After this step, a list of nodes suitable to run pod is created and often there will be more than one. If the list is empty, the pod isn't schedulable. Then comes scoring. The scheduler ranks the remaining node to choose the most suitable node for the pod placement. The scheduler assigns a score to each node that survived filtering. Finally, a pod is assigned to a node which receives the highest ranking. If there are more than one node with equal score, cube scheduler selects one of these in random. Once pods are bound to a node by scheduler, API server updates that information into its CD again. And finally, API server sends a new request along with the pod spec to kubelet process running on each node to run the pod on that node. Kubelet takes a set of pod spec that are provided by API server and then ensures that containers described in these pod specs are running and healthy. Kubelet doesn't manage any container which were not created by Kubernetes. That is, if you run a Docker container by yourself on worker node manually, Kubelet will not manage it. Once Kubelet receives the pod spec, it delegates the container creation to container runtime like Docker or container D using container runtime interface or CRI. Once container runtime creates appropriate container, it notifies Kubelet which again updates API server that pods had been deployed and its status. API server again updates this information into HCD database. So now you know what actually happens when we create deployment in Kubernetes. When we issue a command to see the deployments to API server, it then notifies the client which made the request to create deployment about the state of this deployment which can be viewed using kubectl get deployments. We can see from the output in the ready tab we have three desired pod and number of running pod are also three. Now any change in the state of the pod throughout its life would be again noticed by the controller and the same process is repeated until we obtain the desired state. If the pod fails, then the status is updated in etcd again and shown in ready tab of the deployment which can be used as an entry point to investigate further on why did the pod fail. So that's it. Now you know how Kubernetes creates a deployment. You can use the same knowledge to relate how pods are deployed in Kubernetes when you run kubectl run pods which is if you run create a pod, scheduler notices that change and assign pod to a node and the same process is repeated. So that's all for this video. I hope it was easy to understand. Please like and subscribe and leave a comment below if you have any questions and I would love to hear what you have to say on this one. So until next time, SRE out.